Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Young Scientist, another Young Scientist program webinar. So this Young Scientist, so for the first comers, this, uh, this Young Scientist program webinar series, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's running uh, as a quick uh, uh, kickoff event for the annual uh, meeting of the Brazilian Society of Biochemistry and the Brazilian Society of Biophysics that uh, this year will happen along with the uh, UPAB Congress. So we'll have, we, we, we have a big Congress in October, from October 4th to 8th. And this is like a satellite meeting, a uh, satellite uh, activity to this uh, main program. And originally it was devised to, to take place uh, presentially uh, just before, a few days before the event, but due to, to the pandemic, we have to adapt it to adapt it to a, uh, you know, a virtual format. So uh, these, we, we transformed it in these webinars and they are, they have started in May, they will run to September and uh, they take place every Wednesday at 2 p.m. And in these webinars, uh, at, at each uh, webinar, we have you no know, talks in different uh, 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 themes in biochemistry and biophysics. And we have a, always a leading scientist and also young scientists that work on the field. And uh, the uh, young scientists, we, uh, we, ha we had uh, 32 young scientists that were selected from applicants from all over the world. And uh, at the end, we had 32 uh, uh, selected uh, young scientists from 14 different countries. Uh, so uh, today uh, we're going to have uh, our uh, fifth uh, webinar and uh, we'll have uh, as uh, the leading speaker, the, the keynote speaker will be Dr. Natalie Strynatka from the University of British Columbia at, in Canada and uh, also three, three young scientists and just by chance, they are all working in Argentina. So eventually you could switch our language to Spanish today. Uh, but I just uh, uh, learned that two of them are actually from Cuba. So we have a very international setting today. So uh, uh, just I'd like to give a few structures, structures how the, the, uh, we're going to proceed. So we're going to have the, the main talk is going to be a 15 minute talk. Uh, and, and then we have three short talks with uh, 15 minutes each. And you, uh, the audience will be able to make questions either uh, at the end of each talk, either by, you know, uh, orally, but uh, requesting uh, we can open your microphones or you can also write down in the question and answer tab, okay? So without further ado, I'm gonna uh, introduce Dr. Just a little introduction to Dr. Uh, Stranadka. She was uh, a trained biochemistry uh, at the University of Alberta where she did her uh, master's and PhD. And subsequently, she joined the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of British Columbia, where in Canada, where she's currently a professor of biochemistry and molecular genetics. Uh, Dr. Sarnatica is a biophysicist, and through the study of uh, protein complexes involved in infection, uh, virulence, and bacterial cell wall synthesis using biophysical methods. She has made important contributions to the understanding of the structural mechanisms that underlie bacterial pathogenicity and antibiotic resistance. So Dr. Stranatica, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to give a talk to us. And please uh, just put on your presentation. The room is yours. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Eduardo and, and organizers uh, for this invite. And um, it's so uh, great always to see young scientists having a chance to speak about their research. And I'm really looking forward to the, 
upcoming talks. So um, as uh, Eduardo mentioned, I'm, I'm a biophysicist and structure biology is our sort of at the heart of everything that we do in the lab. And a lot of the projects focus on membrane macromolecular assemblies and roles in pathogenesis and uh, drug resistance. And the one I'll talk to you about today is the type three secretion injectosome, this sort of needle-like uh, nanomachine that many gram-negative bacterial pathogens use to inject virulence proteins into the host. And what I'd like to convey today is sort of the, the use of structural hybrid methods to probe and piece together um, the function and atomic underlying atomic features of these type of complex membrane spanning assemblies. And, and really, how is it that if we're interested in, in uh, antibiotic discovery or drug discovery in general, can we start to attain the kind of high resolution um, with you know, precision in atomic positions and solvation and um, that are often key to designing um, custom drugs for that particular system. Okay, so the type three secretion system or often called the injectosome is common to many gram-negative pathogens. These are just a few listed here. Salmonella, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, really um, prevalent non-sacomial infection in hospitals. Um, Bordetella pertussis, whooping cough, uh, Yersinia, uh, pestis, the bubonic plague, chlamydia, uh, genital and eye disease, a wide spectrum of not only human pathogens, but also plant and animal pathogens rely on this so-called injectosome. And for that reason, uh, there's a lot of interest in antimicrobial discovery against the injectosome and with the thought that these are uh, important, this, this um, nanomachine is important to, to, and is in fact essential for pathogenicity and virulence. But if you inhibit it, you are not killing the bacteria. And this sort of antivirulent strategy has sort of gained ground in the last few years as a way to potentially overcome resistance with many of the classical antibiotics, of course, killing the bacteria. So there's a lot of, of pushback um, and resistance mechanisms against those types of um, bactericidal antibiotics. Uh, vaccines, this is a large um, uh, system with many extracellular components dangling off the outside of the cell that uh, can be targeted uh, for vaccine. And there are, in fact, proven vaccines, uh, uh, um, enteropathogenic E. coli, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, for example. There are cattle vaccines that uh, use as antigens components of the type three system. And then there's been gaining ground in using these systems to actually inject uh, biological therapeutics into host cells. And so there's been some movement in cancer therapy, et cetera, to use the type three system to deliver drugs to um, customized cell types. Okay, so when we started, on, uh, when I started my lab in, in 1997, uh, uh, almost immediately took this, this project on. I had a local collaborator, Brett Finley, a very talented microbiologist who had been uh, working in, on some of the microbial genetics of this system in salmonella and pathogenic E. coli. And so we became interested in, in trying to probe the molecular atomic underpinnings of this system. Of course, it's, it's just then and, and even now, it's sort of your basic structure biology nightmare. It's not only spanning one membrane, but in fact, three membranes. So gram-negative bacteria have a dual membrane system, a so-called inner or cytosolic membrane and an outer membrane. And in this case, the system actually passages through, creates a pore-forming com complex and penetrates the host membrane as well. So three membranes that we have to take into consideration here. And um, there's about two dozen proteins, many of them highly oligomerized and polymerized, uh, about three megadalton in, in, in total size. And this system has never been successfully reconstituted in vitro. Um, and, um, you know, that becomes uh, an issue. And, 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 you know, most of this success so far has come from expressing 
this system in the native species. And the system I'll show you today, Salmonella typhimurium, that was um, the case. We actually engineered strains um, to um, overproduce the type three system, typically doing like 100 liter preps on a weekly basis now for many years um, to, uh, to capture these um, systems within their native membranes. And that seems to be critical for this system and other large membrane systems that we work on using the native membrane. Um, thankfully, uh, you know, we have this sort of toolbox of biophysical techniques we can use uh, to probe the how this system works and, and the, the structural basis for, for how it works. And um, also including uh, using cellular microbiology, there's a lot of relatively facile assays and not only secretion of, a, of molecules, but also um, transfection into the particular host cell uh, type and, and even animal models for the various um, pathogens that uh, we study. So there's, it, it's long been known that there's a sort of defined chronology in, in the secretion and assembly of the type three secretion system. So sort of very briefly, um, there is some type of effector molecule here, uh, shown here, uh, newly synthesized and partially unwound by a customized type 3 secretion chaperone. So many of these effectors have their own type 3 specific chaperone, often encoded um, together. Apologize for that. Okay. Um, and so, the, and this chaperone effector um, is, and we know from structures of, of the chaperone effectors that they, they, the, the chaperones do partially unwind through extensive hydrophobic grooves on their surface, at least a good um, 100 amino acids or so of the effector. And these are then targeted to an ATPase. And we know that um, these complexes can bind to this, the inner membrane components here, including the ATPase. And in rounds of ATP hydrolysis, it's presumed the chaperone is kicked off and this partially unwound effector is fed into the uh, uh, inner membrane portal of the system. And within uh, we've the, uh, this uh, channel, there's an inner lumen of about 25 angstroms, just enough for a partially unwound uh, effector molecule to traverse through um, and be released into the host cytosol. So it's a, there's a direct uh, conduit from the bacterial cytosol through to the host cytosol. And we have sort of regions of the complex that we talk about, this cytosolic complex, including the ATPAs and this so-called export apparatus, or sort of uh, inner membrane gate. There's the so-called basal body, which is sort of the foundation of the system, the structural foundation of the system. Um, uh, into which all other components pack. And these consist of a series of rings. There's a dual nested ring in the inner membrane and this large outer membrane um, portal called a secretin. And it's actually the secretin family is found in other secretion systems. Um, and um, these the inner membrane rings and the outer membrane secretin are actually secreted separately by the general secretory system um, and as are the export apparatus um, which the rings encapsulate can encapsulate around um, they recruit the ATPAs and other cytosolic components and then first um, through type 3 secretion itself secrete this so-called inner rod and needle finally the translacon or the pore forming complex, and then finally effectors. So parts of the type three apparatus are actually secreted, uh, self-secreted, and some of the um, foundation pieces such as these outer membrane secret and inner membrane rings are uh, secreted by the um, general secretory system. And this, this again, these, uh, the secret and the inner membranes are sort of the foundation. And we spent many years using um, 
the sort of low resolution EM maps that were typical of the time, uh, 20 angstrom maps, and you can see this here in, in the light gray. And then we would use X-ray crystallography and NMR to look at structures of individual components um, or pieces of these components and starting off on these basal body foundation pieces, these uh, inner membrane rings, and as much as we could understand about the outer membrane um, secretin portal using crystallography and NMR. And what we um, were able to define is that this basal body um, foundation components um, involved many of these so-called ring building motifs. We actually defined these uh, way back in 2005, these um, uh, uh, helical um, uh, motifs that can pack, so, so they're alpha beta motifs that can pack um, and associate very intimately to create rings of different stoichiometries. And so the first ring that we were able to characterize is one is this primary inner membrane ring. Um, and fortuitously in the crystal through the uh, crystallographic uh, symmetry, we were actual, actually able to define a ring of, of, of of a stoichiometry number of 24 and then went on to show that it fit quite beautifully to the uh, low resolution EM maps that were existed at the time and went on to do a number of different uh, biotinylation and other methylation, um, 35S methylation studies to further support this 24 mer nature. We also uh, went on to determine other pieces of the using this uh, either crystallography or NMR and found a number of these ring building motifs. In fact, there's nine of these motifs. Um, there are two that we characterized within the outer membrane region and um, the two inner membrane rings also defined by several of these uh, motifs that stack um, like the, the common child's toy uh, stack upon each other. And um, we, we also established at that time a, a collaboration with David Baker, who's a computational chemist, a Howard Hughes investigator, and uh, he has developed uh, many variants of Rosetta, um, which, uh, and including one which um, were, were used to predict these ring of formation. So here we captured it fortuitously in the crystal, but in, in other pieces we did not, and we actually had to use Rosetta uh, along with mutagenesis to try and build these models. Okay, so this was about 15 years of work right here. <laughs> and, um, but there were still many questions. And for one is um, these stoichiometries, although again, we had to predict using Ro Rosetta and sometimes they were not um, unambiguous in the modeling. And if you ever do uh, ring modeling, large ring modeling, you'll see that with small tweaks, you can fit in another monomer uh, fairly readily. And so, it, you know, coming down, deciding what that was became um, challenging. And for example, so if these inner membrane rings are 24 mers, our crystallographic structure would suggest in follow up work, um, the, the inner, uh, the outer membrane uh, ring building units here that we at the periphery, the so called coupling domain of this large secretin um, that couple to the inner membrane rings, we got anywhere to 12 to 15 and it wasn't clear exactly how this stoichiometries would couple with each other. And then finally, the, the secretin itself, um, despite much effort by our lab and many other labs to get crystals of this large portal in, in type three and other secretion systems, there was no, secre no um, information available. So this is where we really um, were very uh, thankful to take part in the revolution that happened in the past uh, you know, five to seven years on cryo-EM such that we could start to, to capture large pieces of this system. And in this case, we started with the basal body, these inner membrane rings and the outer membrane secretin. And, um, and I think just to say that, um, you know, when, we, when taking this on this, this uh, project as a young investigator, uh, it was a little bit, <laughs> I don't know, uh, I think brave, uh, maybe uh, silly, but what what 
I can say is that although I, I you know, we did make fair progress with the piece by piece uh, crystallographic um, method that I just talked about in modeling and, and all of the supporting mutagenesis work to try to build that model. What it also did is it made us very good at making sample and structure biology, it's all about the sample. And so when this revolution came about in cryo-EM, we were there ready to take advantage because we've been making and, and perfecting these samples for so many years. So you never know what's around the corner. And especially, I think this is true now in biophysics, so many amazing techniques coming into play. So we started with the basal body and we purposely made um, strains that had a deletion that would not produce needles. So you would, you would the system would stop at um, just the inner membrane rings and the outer membrane um, with, with no subsequent needle produced and our mass spec of these produced proteins verified that. And what we were able to capture using um, uh, the single particle and a 300 keV microscope um, is a now into the four angstrom um, uh, type resolution of, of these structures. And in fact, as if you work in cryo-EM, you know that there, there's sort of differential resolutions along a, along a structure depending on motions, localized motions, et cetera. And in fact, what we found is that those inner membrane nested rings, those dual nested rings that are the basis of everything, um, when we applied the C20, the, 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 the 24-fold symmetry we'd already suggested from our earlier work was very clear even in the, in the C1 or unsymmetrized maps. When we applied C24, we were able to improve the resolution even further um, to into the low three angstrom. And you know, the, the type of density where side chains are clearly defined and we could unambiguously trace these models now in these cryo-EM reconstructions. And this is what we see here. These are the inner membrane nested rings. Again, this, this basis here for the basal body, this, this foundation structure. And I show this view to show you all of the intimate interactions between the uh, two rings, one in gold, one in green here. And there's a many, many non-covalent interactions that stabilize those two rings. And just to compare to our previous model, and so using Rosetta and, and based on our crystallographic structures, what we see is we actually came very close in the in the independent rings, in the disposition of the monomers, the way that they pack with each other, this reoccurring ring building motif theme. But what you see is this big gap here. And this is where the, the piecing together models become and, and, um, and uh, the Rosetta modeling become less certain. And you can see that we have these big gaps. And part of that, the reason for that, so we always knew that there was missing pieces to our model. Um, and for example, these two nested rings are formed by these multiple ring building motifs. Here's the inner gold ring and the outer green ring. And these, each of these circles is a ring building motif. And the, the terminal ring building motif of the inner circle has this linker to its TM. So there's each of these um, 20 formers have a, have a TM. So there's 48 TMs in total. And, you know, in crystallography, we often cut off this type of region to get ordered crystals. So a linker to a TM is usually incredibly hard to um, capture in, in a, and so it was missing from our crystal structure. So not surprising then it's going to be missing from our model. But what we see in fact in our EM structure is this linker is the glue that provides all of the non-covalent hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic electrostatic interactions between the two rings. And that's, so that's certainly the caveat. So you can come pretty close to modeling, but you know, understanding the interfaces between the different components becomes the challenge. And this is where cryo-EM is so revolutionary. So we had, again, this was um, deliberately uh, designed to have no needle. And what we see is that, um, in the outer membrane, so this secretin, this is this outer membrane portal has never been characterized before. And perhaps not supply, surprising, we see this large, um, we call this the periplasmic gate 
keeping this system closed to the outside world. Otherwise, it would be this, you know, large opening about 75 angstroms to the outside world, and it would be deleterious to the cells. So it's in this closed state. Um, the, the resolution of the um, uh, outer membrane secretin barrel was considerably uh, less than that of the um, inner membrane ring. And, um, and what was also clear is that the symmetry of the outer membrane was likely different from the, C, from, from the inner membrane rings. And that there's also some, some localized motion of the outer membrane ring relative to the inner membrane ring. And the overall effect was this lower resolution such that we, it was, we couldn't ambiguously trace it. So at that time, we, we knew of techniques to actually use high base treatment to release the secretin. So we would express this in our salmonella cells and these 100 liter preps, and then do base treatment and release the secretin. And from that, in its isolated state, it was highly ordered. We could unambiguously define its, its C15 symmetry, again, different from the 24-fold of the inner membrane rings and allowed us to trace for the first time this uh, secretin uh, outer membrane portal. And um, just to, to also say that um, in, our, in our EM reconstructions, we clearly are able to visualize the, the detergent micelles that surround and define the outer membrane spanning and inner membrane spanning regions of, this, of these molecules. So, uh, Pretty cool. You're capturing two micelles in the same sample. You're never going to do that in crystallography. And so this was um, pretty amazing. So how is this thing built? It um, involves a, uh, again, this series of ring building domains, these small alpha beta domains. And what was, these are all labeled here. And, and um, uh, at the base of the secretin barrel is a particularly um, uh, type tight binding uh, ring building motif. And you, there's an extensive hydrophobic interface that probably allows for rapid um, uh, assembly. So by first creating this ring, which then um, subsequently aligns the beta strands of the barrel uh, uh, and, and facilitates assembly. And this, the, the, just to say here that these ring building domains really provide then this tunable um, way to create more or less stably uh, structured parts of the uh, of the assembly. So the inner membrane rings have more extensive um, interactions, again, more stable, they're the foundation, where something like the terminal or coupling domains of the secretin, here we call them N0 and N1, have much less extensive domains. And this is because they uh, likely need to be more flexible to allow for coupling. Remember the outer membrane secretin, the inner membrane are, are secreted separately by the general secretion system and they need to find each other and couple during the assembly process. And these ring building motifs are a way to allow that for ha to happen. Okay, so N3 is at the base of this secretin barrel. This is shown here. And again, they've, this ring building um, layer forms many uh, stabilizing non-covalent interactions with the subsequent so-called secretin beta domain. And these are a dual um, walled uh, set of, of uh, beta sheets that in the, so they're each of four strands that times 15 creates the 60 stranded outer membrane wall and 60 stranded inner membrane wall with one of the hairprints of the inner membrane wall protruding into the lumen of the secretin to create that closed gate. And so this is the gate that keeps the, the secretin closed until the needle is secreted through it and then subsequently all of the effectors, et cetera, within that lumen of the needle. Um, a, another uh, really unique feature of the, of the secretin is this um, so-called secretin lip, which is, um, uh, for, creates the, the membrane spanning region. So you can see, I think this gives you a feel of how large this um, molecule is. This is the membrane spanning region here in gold. And so a lot of, of the secretin is actually to span the periplasm and encapsulate um, 
couple to the inner membrane rings and encapsulate the needle that's going to be secreted through it. Um, this some interesting features of membrane insertion here. The the by far the um, most conserved region of the secretin family, so throughout the whole molecule, is this amphipathic loop, and it so it has this. Um, hydrophobic face and electropositive face, so similar to like a cationic disruptive peptide that can penetrate membranes. We believe this loop is critical to um, uh, uh, attaching to the to the inner uh, leaflet of the outer membrane and perturbing, perturbing it locally such that the rest of the more classical membranes beta uh, type membrane spanning region of the secretin, which includes many aromatics and some electropositives uh, and typical span, or it can then be inserted into the leaflet. So disrupting amphipathic loop and then allowing insertion. And indeed, the secretins are one of the few beta type structures that do not require the BAM system for insertion into the outer membrane. Most beta um, outer membrane pro proteins absolutely require BAM, but Trevor Lithgow and others have actually, um, in BAM's uh, deletion mutants, showed that secretins insert uh, just fine into the outer membrane. And this, this self-perturbing region is likely why, and we've done many mutations in here and shown that, yes, it does um, prevent outer membrane um, uh, insertion. And uh, if we look at this in our structures, in fact, in this, this amphipathic loop is shown here, and we see it's uh, flanked by uh, the detergent micelle in our structures, again, supporting this notion of its membrane insertion. The, um, another uh, important uh, feature of these secretins is this little uh, C-terminal uh, helical domain. And this actually acts as a clamp. So here in rainbow, we have a single monomer um, of, of uh, the um, secretin, so one of the 15. And you can see that this C-terminal helical clamp is N plus two, so it reaches over and creates this sort of interdigitated interaction with the outer surface of the, of the barrel. And so that creates, again, this um, inherently stable uh, structure that is sort of the hallmark of secretins, which are denatrin and heat resistant pores. And considering the, the environment that these uh, pathogens live in, for example, salmonella is in the, in the gut, um, the, the stability is actually uh, very important. This C-terminal uh, helical region has also been shown, so we've used a combination of NMR and X-ray crystallography, and um, uh, Paul Alario and Trevor Moraes and, and Dorothy Majewski in the lab have used these techniques to show, show that the C-terminal most helix actually binds to this small piloton-like protein, this chaperone, that's again type 3 specific, that is responsible, itself a lipoprotein, is responsible for targeting the secretin in its monomeric form to the outer membrane. And if you get rid of pilotins or this secretion, uh, this um, C-terminal region, again, um, you end up, the, the secretin actually ends up going into the inner membrane. It doesn't ever get to the outer membrane in an effective way. And you can see this C-terminal helix lying across this piloton interface. So what we think is, is happening is that these um, pilotins grab the C-terminal hand of, the, of a monomeric um, uh, 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 secretin and um, using the Lowell pathway um, tar uh, um, target it to the outer membrane as Lowell um, uh, targeted uh, proteins are. That amphipathic loop is again membrane perturbing and it starts to locally perturb the membrane um, and until an effective concentration allows for rapid ring formation of that very uh, extensive ring building domain in N3 helps align the um, beta strands of each monomer uh, relative to one another in a, in a productive way such that the uh, secretin is finally assembled to its tip where it then can um, insert into the mem this perturbed membrane. 
And actually, um, Tony Pugsley and others have captured some of these intermediate states using EM in the type two system. Okay, so what about the needle then? And if we look at the secretin from the outer membrane and inner membrane or periplasmic view, we see this uh, very electropositive uh, lumen. This gate is closed, so there's nowhere to protrude through for the needle, but this electropositive and the span that we observe is very um, complementary to the needle structure. And uh, Adam Lang's group, for example, had determined by solid state NMR a model of the salmonella needle, and you see this electronegative complementarity and again a span that's in keeping. But what we'd really like to see, of course, is a needle complex. And this eluded us for a few years until we got better and more, basically more gentle at extracting these needle complexes. And this is sort of the heroic work of, of um, Jin Hong Hu and Maria Vukovic, Liam Worrell and Claire Atkinson, who, again, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of liters of, of these preps to get them just right and many different um, ideas on st building strains to help stabilize um, them. And so we then uh, went on to collect this data now in our own facility here, and which we've had for the last um, four years at UBC, uh, another Titan cryos in the basement. And um, what we observed is that um, the, uh, in this needle complex, Again, the, the foundation, these dual inner mes, mes, uh, nested rings are the, the dominating force, very strong signal. Um, we get very nice resolution, again, can unambiguously trace them. And what we see is in fact, they've changed very little from the closed state or needle-less state of the basal body. So they again, remain static and everything else builds um, uh, uh, within them. And we see now, um, a, a number of densities within the lumen of, of the basal body that we, of course, want to understand how they work. Now, the, this is where we really sort of kind of revolutionize the way we refine, a, a, we process and refine the data. And basically the idea is, so if we, if we look, if we collect data on these needle complexes, the, you can see by these bright rings here, it's again, it's these inner membrane rings that are the dominating signal and they will dominate, including their symmetry will dominate. Um, and so what one can do is within the same data, data set, subtract the signal from this dominating inner membrane feature to let other features shine. And in this case, for example, the outer membrane secretin. So clearly in the needle complex, we can't release the secretin. We want it there relative to the needle. And this is a way through data processing, we now can um, accrue the you know, high resolution information on these various components. Again, of all many of these components with differing symmetries, but closely aligned. And so it's this um, signal subtraction, and then focusing the, the using masks, the refinement on just the region of interest one at a time, and then you build it all back together. Um, and um, so we, you know, again, we're able to attain the secretin. Now it's in the open form because the needle is there. And um, we see this 75 angstrom opening and uh, a alignment of that prior hairpin that had been protruding into the middle. Um, in our in the closed structure now realigned against the back wall and um, creating this uh, open form that allows the secretin substrate to come through. And we did many, many different mutants to probe this opening um, uh, in this system. And just to say that this closed form we captured earlier and this open needle complex form match overlay beautifully onto cryo-electron tomography work of um, Junyu and, and in this case in Salmonella. And this was very gratifying to see how our, our atomic structures fit very well with data obtained within in situ, within the context of the, the cells that um, the, this work was collected on. So um, again, there's this whole issue of closely aligned symmetries and using this focus refinement and, um, and uh, signal subtraction, we systematically went through and tried to understand some of the uh, 
outline questions in our structure. And, and one of them is how does this outer membrane portal couple if, if, the, if the symmetry is 15, how does it couple with inner membrane rings, which are 24? And it had always bothered us that our coupling domains were always of lower resolution, could not be unambiguously traced. We could place our crystallographic or NMR models uh, reasonably well, but clearly this, this coloring here shows you that this was much higher resolution, poor, less well-defined. And what, um, again, we had to change our strategy to understand what was really going on in this coupling, because it has to be relatively strong to withstand again these um, uh, uh, all of the the uh, secretion events that were going on uh, within it. And what we just to cut to the chase, what was needed is uh, we had always uh, been. Um, uh, uh, considering these coupling domains as part of the secretin rather than as part of the inner membrane rings. And when we changed our strategy to, to um, signal subtraction uh, encapsulating this region, we um, were able to uh, clearly see that in fact there was an extra monomer in the coupling domains that of, of the secretin. So the C15 is totally unambiguous in the, in the outer membrane beta barrel region, but these coupling domains acquire a 16th monomer that allows then a repeating eightfold 3-2 symmetry. And there's a number of non-covalent interactions that are at this interface. We see now a clear, highly extensive interface between the coupling domains and the inter inner membrane rings and with a stoichiometry that now makes sense that you can have that repeating set of interactions. And um, that was completely unexpected. And but it really, I think, changed the field and all the structures subsequent in, in flagella and, and type three have have uh, re, you know, have supported this, this uh, unusual added uh, monomer to create that coupling. Um, so just uh, um, some additional components now that we began to define um, are the, of course, the components within the um, inner membrane ring. So this so-called export apparatus, you can see this sort of toroidal density here in gold. And what's interesting is these export apparatus proteins, again, they are secreted also by the general secretion system. And then the inner membrane rings um, are thought to pack around it. And, but if you look at a, a membrane prediction um, of a sequence prediction of these export apparatus components here. Everyone always thought they were membrane proteins and always talked about them that way. Um, but what became clear, and, and they predict very clearly as membrane proteins, but what's clear in our structures and subsequent structures from flagella by Susan Lee's group and others uh, is that the inner membrane rings act as sort of a nano disc and lift or stabilize these um, hydrophobic helices, which form these coiled coil toroidal structures within the lumen of the nested rings. And you can see that here, um, this, uh, this uh, toroidal export apparatus. And this is sort of the gate, this is sort of the uh, entrance way for secreted proteins. And recently Thomas Marlowitz's lab has um, captured this structure with a substrate going through and it's very subtle opening of this export apparatus is required to allow this substrate um, through. And so you see these coil coil um, here in gold is the export apparatus. Um, additional components that build upon that are this so-called rod protein in magenta. And everyone thought they called it the inner rod historically for many years. And it's not till our structures that it was clear that in fact, they're more like an adapter. They're not the inner rod that passes through the periplasm and then the needle starts at, on the outside of the outer membrane. It's just an adapter a, um, that binds to the export apparatus components and then sets the helicity of the subsequent needle here in purple. And so it sets the strict helical parameters of the needle. And, and, um, and uh, 
the, the, the needles and also uh, in some species, the extended filaments that go can go well beyond that, up to 700 nanometers, uh, were defined by, um, again, Jin Hong Hu, and, and this is Brahman Lian's. And what they observed in the needle, these um, uh, high resolution structures using cryo-EM is, is these interesting repeats of electropositive um, nature that we believe and, and have supported through mutagenesis uh, are critical to pushing um, the uh, substrate through to the uh, outside, whether first the needle itself or subsequently uh, the translacon pore forming complex and virulence proteins. And you can see here that the span within these needles uh, is just enough for a, a helix, for example, but a folded protein would not fit. It's about, again, this 25 angstrom. And what's so cool about um, uh, cryo-EM is that in the same sample, you can actually capture conformational snapshots in different populations. And this was the case in, in uh, several of our samples that we could go from a closed um, basal body through to the, the rod and part of the needle, the needle growing, the, the gate starting to uh, open, and finally the uh, needle pushing through the gate and the gate in the completely open state. And these are all defined, again, at you know, three to four angstrom resolution. So this is the power of EM. Um, again, these match very well uh, to cryo, um, cryo-ET um, uh, experiments. Uh, again, this is the salmonella from Jun Liu. So here's our crystallographic and EM structures. Of, uh, yeah, at this point, these are all EM structures um, overlaid on the cryo-electron tomography. And you see the beautiful complementarity here. You also see there's still some unanswered questions um, here and is particularly in the cytosolic region. And when you think, you know, we have ideas about, um, again, you know, based on these structural hybrid approach of, of how the system is, is um, assembled. Again, the separate general secretion of the export apparatus, the seek outer membrane secretin, the inner membrane rings, again, uh, membrane anchored through 48 uh, membrane anchors encapsulate and, and pull out of the membrane the, the export apparatus gate. Uh, this then allows the ATPase, the recruitment of the uh, first the rod. Um, this rod we know from uh, work by Brian Birkenshaw in the lab uh, use is actually the uh, localizes a transglycosylase that clears locally the peptidoglycan layer between the inner and outer membrane and start uh, and allows for the outer membrane inner membrane components to find each other through this cleared peptidoglycan um, the more fluid um, coupling domains now can clamp down and um, uh, form that extensive coupling interface with the inner membrane rings recruiting a 16th component to complete the stoichiometry and then we get recruitment of um, the needle and um, uh, through this formed basal body and then subsequently the, the effectors. And so really it's the, the cytosolic region that's sort of the next frontier and Dorothy Majewski in the lab was able to solve the ATPase for the first time a couple years ago. Uh, we knew from crystal structures that it likely is similar to the FOF1 ATPase, uh, except it was a homohexamer, but what she was able to capture is very similar um, ac um, uh, activity states um, of this ATP-driven motor with this inner stock that she also captured in her structure and in rounds of ATP hydrolysis, it um, defines these conformational changes between dimeric sets within the hexmeric ATPAs. And we believe this rotation of the rod then interacts with this un, uh, relatively uncharacterized inner membrane protein. Um, this, this is really of incredible interest to many in the field now, how this works. We know proton motive force is involved and it's likely what's driving um, in turn the opening of that toroidal export gate 
and allowing these effectors to pass through. Okay, so uh, I'd just like to thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I think I've uh, thanked most of the people already through the talk. Again, um, uh, great uh, collaboration with Brett Finley and Wenyan Dang, as well as uh, Sam Miller and Dave Baker at University of Washington. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. So do, 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 do uh, are, are there questions from the audience? Someone would like to... Oh, there's uh, one question from uh, Tony Watts. Uh, maybe maybe Tony wants to ask the question himself. Yes, would you like to, 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 to make your question orally? Otherwise I can read it as well as well. Yeah, uh, okay. Just open your, your microphone. Marcelo, can you help with that? One minute. I did it already. It's okay. Thanks a lot. Hi, Natalie. Sorry, I don't think we've met Tony Watts here in Oxford. Beautiful story, lovely. Um, and and on a lot of your slides, you kind of alluded to lipid or detergent, but I don't think once you mentioned whether there's any importance at all about the membrane component or the lipid part in terms of stability or insertion. It, 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 have you looked at that or has anybody looked at that or do you know anything about the lipid involvement? Yeah, so um, we do capture uh, lipid bound in our structures, but not, um, not ordered enough to really define what they are. And we have uh, uh, thought about, you know, trying to do mass spec methods or um, certainly the amphipathic loop that I mentioned that's sort of, of a, a pre perturbing of the membrane that we, we have done some uh, lipid planar bilayer studies uh, mutating that and definitely it, it does uh, make a difference um, with uh, subsequent insertion of the, of the um, secretin itself. I guess the, the, the hard part is that you know, we don't have a fully reconstituted system. And so it's um, uh, been challenging, I guess, to do some of those studies. But if anyone no. has ideas, <laughs> I will. No, no, no. I mean, you said right at the beginning, no, is fully reconstituted. I understand that entirely. But, yeah. you know, there's a lot of crystallography that is determined by lipid components. Some proteins will and won't crystallize with certain lipids and obviously lipid is involved in activity, ATPases and, and the like. So it, it seems that the lipid will have some importance there, in particular ATPases, which obviously are of interest. So I, I was just wondering if, 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 you know, did you add lipid back to any of your complexes to form them? Do they form better? Do they form worse? Have you actually looked at any of that or you just take what comes? I, I can say we spent about a decade trying to make the secretins from various species uh, express in E. coli and we have every type of E. coli expression system and um, we it was we could never get good expression we had, that's why we had to go to the native strains and um, for to to actually pull out um, uh, the the oligomerized secretin yeah yeah so I mean, you kind of like yeah. something about a native membrane and the lipids that's critical. Yeah. Okay, there's other people who have questions. I'll let them have a go. Nice to work. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Emerson Carmona raised his hand. Emerson, can you make your question, please? Yeah. Um, hi. hi. Uh, first, first of all, thanks for, for 
your talk, your beautiful talk, and to share with us this amazing structure. I just, I just uh, wonder about a little about the detergent that you use. Uh, if the protein was uh, prefer was preferential for one type of detergent, and and you mentioned about a series of leaks or or um, conditions that we use to stabilize the protein and. I, I would appreciate if you can share with us a little like what what were the main factors that affected the quality, the biochemical quality of your of your protein. Yeah. So uh, the detergent is definitely critical. And I, I think this is it was a very good lesson for us, not only for this system, but subsequently for others, is you know, very often we use a detergent looking for the most extraction. Oh, we got lots of protein from that one. Okay, that's good. But in fact, that um, may not be leading to the most um, structured or um, stable uh, protein. It's just that you've extracted more out and possibly the lipids, it needs to be happy along, you know, are left behind when it's too harsh a detergent. And so, that was really the breakthrough for us in getting the needle complex, for example, is using as gentle a detergent treatment as possible, gentle lysis as possible. Um, yeah, and so you can't go by yield. You really have to go by how happy your final protein is. And um, yeah, so that, that extraction doesn't equal you know, quality sample. Um, and we usually use neutral, non-ionizing detergents. Um, so DDM, DM are very common. Um, and uh, yeah, so in terms of expression, a lot of the engineering first involved just playing with regulators and trying to just get the overall system expressed. Uh, so. You know, this, it's all a relative term. So from 100 liters, we're getting about a mig of complex, and that's in the optimized state. So, um, you know, you're likely never going to have thousands of these on each cell. It's just too deleterious to the cell to have that many. But um, so playing with with regulators is uh, sort of the first step. And then what we, as we learn more and more about the um, assembly, we for example, to get the closed conformation, which we felt would be the most stable aspect to start with, we knew that this cytosolic um, component of the inner membrane ring, one of the inner membrane rings has a cytosolic ring building motif, which we had actually structurally characterized by NMR. And we knew from those studies, if we deleted that small domain in the cytoplasm, um, the, the um, uh, ATPAs and other, and then subsequently the needle were not recruited, and so we would get a needleless complex. And so, but that one did prove to be a very structured and stable starting point uh, for our studies. And we've, we've done probably several hundred mutants now of these structures, so characterizing them in secretion assays and transfection assays and a number even in cell in, um, in mouse models for salmonella. And so from those, we found additional kind of points of, of uh, structural intervention that we kind of figured out from the phenotype they were given. And then they proved to, to isolate in a structural snapshot that we were interested in. Uh, we have now, Rafael wants to make a question. Eduardo, there is a question in the Q&A tab that I think was asked before Rafael raised his hand. Okay, so you okay. so, uh, can read here. Um, uh, from uh, Alessandro Nascimento, uh, amazing work, thank you. As you mentioned, beautiful results like those you showed us take time to be obtained and depend on having good samples, which may take a long time. What advices would you leave for young researchers and early career academics who are starting their career as structural biologists? 
Yeah, so I think that the beauty of this system, although, uh, you know, challenging is there was always components that could be that on their own are very interesting and, you know, maybe suitable for a student project. And so if you can find a system where there's enough breakout components to study while you're pursuing the big dream, <laughs> I think that's the ideal case. And yeah, and we, and we had many surprises, things that we had no idea would be interesting turned out to be really interesting. Um, having the functional readout is really helpful for you to know uh, that. And so if you have either if you do microbiology in your own lab or have good collaborations, I think that does make a big difference in knowing, you know, what, what to pursue or to make even a, what you might think is a small component, actually a very interesting story. Great. You said Thank to you. dream big, I think. <laughs> and, and, and most to really interest you. I, I, I still love this system and there's still so many questions and it's crazy competitive now, but you just still keep <laughs> trying to answer the questions because you may look at it differently than someone else. Cool. Rafael, would you like to make your question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you for, for the interesting talk. Uh, first of all, uh, I understand this is a, a, a machine that is unique to gram-negative bacteria because there are three membranes involved. Uh, anyway, I, I imagine there, there is maybe an equivalent uh, in gram-positive bacteria uh, that is involved in injecting virulent factors. That, can you have, give some info on that? Yeah, so there, there is the type 7 secretion system, which it's still a lot of questions about whether it actually um, directly injects into host. Um, it likely, but those components haven't really been well characterized in, in um, many of the gram positives. Um, there's, uh, um, yeah, I guess for gram positives, that would be a, a main one. Okay. Um, yeah. But this, this should be uh, simpler uh, machines, right? Yeah, or, definitely. Or smaller, at least. Yeah. And yet still uh, efficient yeah, in injecting materials, right? It's still the, you know, because gram positives have that thicker cell wall, so they still need to get through that. And, okay. Um, okay, I was wondering how, how gram negative could take advantage of, of, yeah. of a bigger probably bigger, bigger uh, system yeah. in the process. Okay. Um, I have one quick question. I'm totally from outside this field and I've, it was a great and great talk. So I, I was curious because you mentioned that in, the, uh, uh, in, in cryo EM, you can capture different structures in the same sample. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, does it relate to the steady state? Can you make inference about the, I mean, I mean about the dynamics of the of these uh, structures as they move from one to another by the amount of structures you capture in each state? Is it possible? I think we could get there now with the even faster detectors. Um, uh, you know, just being able to to. Um, capture that many more particles. So you just have a greater distribution and the statistical basis. I think one could move towards that. Of course, it does depend also on the conditions of vitrification and if the vitrification itself is affecting the sample. So there are those caveats, but um, certainly I think uh, as we can define like spectrums of conformational states, between, you know, perhaps more well-populated conformational state populations that um, one could move to kinetic <laughs> analysis. Great. Yeah, the, the data processing is onerous. It's getting better and a lot of the software is improving by the day. 
um, but some of the, but really large data sets, you know, really can tax computational systems and and the individuals <laughs> having to decipher what they all mean. I, I think that will become more and more automated, and certainly there's talk of AI dress processing and things like that. You know. There is one more question here. Chuck, would you like to make your question orally? I can just, uh, you're open to make your question. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. We can. Hi. Yeah. Uh, Natalie, uh, very, very, very nice talk. Um, so this mi mi uh, symmetry mismatch, or the resolution of the, the mystery of the symmetry mismatch was very interesting. So this extra component that donates just the N0, N1 domain, what do you think, what do you think is happening with the rest of the protein? Is it just cleaved or do you think it's just disordered floating about in the periplasm? Well, there is this, you know, population of monomers um, drifting in the membrane until they have sufficient local concentration to create a 15-mer. Um, so it could be just, potentially could still even be anchored and slot in. We, we, we don't see any evidence for ordered density past, um, you know, a little bit of linker of the, of the unit that's bound within the coupling ring. So we don't see any evidence that it's still there. Um, it's given the, uh, you know, the low um, quantity of sample, it's, you know, we were trying to, to do mass spec um, yeah. and see if we could, but it, 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 yeah, it's, a, it's a complex system to do that. So we haven't been able to do that. Um, whether there's a, we, we tried to look for, you know, known proteases in Salmonella periplasm, <laughs> but uh, from what the ones we knew, we didn't see evidence of cleavage. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we're still trying to figure out. That was one of the reviewer questions for sure, and a question I always get asked. Yeah. <laughs> but I think what's clear is, I mean, one, it, you know, it, it makes order of everything in that region. Um, and makes clear the, the interface and it makes sense and you can support it by mutagenesis and then subsequent structures have also, um, you know, re-supported this. So I, I think, you know, it all makes sense, but it's, yeah, it's very puzzling. Like, how does that happen? Yeah. Yeah, there's a similar, there's a similar symmetry mismatch uh, phenomenon in, in some type four secretion systems as well. Right. Yeah, in the helicobacter system at least. And is that in a coupling region? Yeah, it's well, it's it's between sort of the outer membrane and the inner membrane. It's, you know, in the in the transition between the outer membrane and the inner membrane complex. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we're good, Melanie. Oh. Yes. Yes. Exactly. No. Exactly. Uh, okay, uh, I think there is maybe one follow up question, but I'm kind of worried about the time. So I think I'm going to forward the question to Natalie and she can uh, reply lately. So we could now I'd like to you know thank you again for your great talk and